You're listening to the Amblecote Community Church Podcast. Well, hello everyone and thanks for listening to this podcast. Um, This is a series of three podcasts that we're doing where we're looking at, um, well, we've called it Genesis in the beginning and we're going to be looking at creation, we're going to be looking at evolution, we're going to be looking at the Big Bang theory. And we're doing this because we taught through the book of Genesis recently. And as part of that series, we did a few evenings looking particularly at the creation story. The reason we did that is as you begin teaching through the book of Genesis, the natural questions begin to arise around creation, uh, around science, around evolution and all these things. And we said, well, rather than try and attack those fairly meaty subjects uh, on a Sunday morning, let's look at it on an evening and have it interactive and things like that. So we did that over three evenings. And then uh, we said, well, you know, we've done all the hard work, really. So why don't we do some podcasts and try and get some of that content and a bit of a conversation around this. And to do that with me, I am joined by the wonderful, the amazing uh, Andrew McFall and David Faulkner. So welcome. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, thanks it's very much. Nice really to be here. appreciate you um, doing this and really appreciate you doing the evenings. I think we had a good time together um, putting those together and kind of exploring that and having some a chance to explore this conversation with our church family. Um, so that was really good. Um, and I want to say from the off, because you'll thank me for this, that we're not claiming to be experts in this field. There are minds far greater than ours that have both uh, explored this topic, debated this topic, um, and many around today, many throughout history. Um, but I think it's fair to say that we've done a bit of reading and that we have a passion maybe about these topics and that um, that led us to really want to help our church family explore this. And I think you'd agree with that, wouldn't you? Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I know, David, you took about, I think it was about six months out of your work, didn't you, to kind yeah. of look into this? Yeah, I took a sabbatical in 2010 for six months, a long time ago now. But yeah, spent some time um, looking at this whole area. So uh, yeah, it's something that I think matters and something yeah. I've spent a bit of time thinking about. But yeah, definitely like you say, not professing to be an expert either theologically or scientifically. Yeah, and then Andrew, I know that you studied at university, so that's kind of where that's some right. of your interest and training comes from, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I studied physics at university, and there was a point when uh, my understanding of science and the faith that I'd grown up with, they had to be sort of meshed together in some kind of way because you can't live with these things separate forever. Yeah, yeah. So I think we'd say we're three members of our church family here at Amblecote, who have done some reading, have a passion for this topic and want to kind of explore that yeah. with our church family. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. Is that fair? Great. So what we're going to be doing then, just to give anyone who's listening a bit of a, an idea of how this is going to work, uh, in this first podcast, we're going to look at um, reading Genesis 1 and 2 well. Um, I'm going to mainly sort of be leading on that because that was my session. And um, Then in session two, we're going to look at the Big Bang Theory and how we can hold together um, that theory and what's going on there in the scientific world with um, a sort of reading of the, a faithful reading of Genesis, but also other parts of scripture as well that refer to creation. And then in the third part, and Andrew, you'll be kind of taking a bit of a lead on that because you did Mm -hmm. the content. And then the third podcast, David, you're going to lead us through um, thinking about evolution. Yeah. Um, again, um, with a, a real focus on how does our reading of the Bible kind of interact with that and how do we work that through? Yeah. Sound good? So that's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to begin by praying and then we'll kick off looking at Genesis uh, 1 and 2 particularly. So Father, we just thank you um, that we can do this. Father, we thank you for uh, the gift of technology that um, allows us to be together in this way. And uh, we just pray, Father, as much as we would love a great conversation, we really ask that you'd be present Mm. and that you would make your word known to our hearts and that you would reveal who you are to us in these subjects, Lord. And we thank you who you are. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So I will say, uh, you know, I do make apologies if this one is a lot of me talking because I'm going to be, you know, hosting and 
asking the questions, but I'm also going to be delivering a lot of the content in this one. But let's start by asking the question, and really, why bother? Why does this topic matter, which is where we started on those evenings? And yeah. I've got three that I raised, but I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, guys, on this. But um, firstly, it matters. This subject matters because scripture matters. I know it matters to you too. It matters to me. I know it matters to us as a church family, I think. And um, we would take what we call a high view of scripture, which means we can't sort of take the easy way of lowering what scripture says and say, well, we're not really going to take that. We have to take scripture seriously. Um, And therefore, the discoveries of science mean that we have to then come back to the text and wrestle with it. So that was my first point. Second one, which was really helpful for me and Probably, David, I have to say, some of my conversations with you back in, I forget when you said, was it 2010? 2010, 2010, maybe helped me with some of this back then, which was to help us understand there is a range of views that we're, quote unquote, allowed to have if we take a high view of scripture on this particular topic. And I think that was really helpful for me because I think I grew up maybe thinking, if you didn't hold a particular view, then you weren't a real Christian. So that's number two. I think it's important. And then number three, I think we can sometimes be taught or told that actually um, you can't, you know, almost taught that you can't hold a high view of Scripture and the teachings of Scripture with kind of common sense, scientific or um, a scientific thinking or scientific brain. It's almost like we push, we push to pick which one do we want to be? Yeah, yeah. So what do you think of those? Do you agree? Is there any others you would add in? I think it's um, really helpful, Tim. I I think whilst we all know that people who are perhaps uh, pro-science might sort of easily use that as a basis for dismissing Christian faith, actually for many people, um, it's a genuine struggle, a genuine issue to say, I'm interested in the Christian faith or I see there's something in it, but science has a high place, high place of authority in our society and in our culture, perhaps particularly amongst young people, but not exclusively. And so for some, I think it is a genuine barrier to exploring Christian faith with an open mind and an open heart because it is assumed that you can't do that and hold on to contemporary scientific conclusions. Uh, And None of the things that we're going to say are going to make that um, wrestling easy. No. But I think it's important to say, actually think about it, and it's not um, quite as straightforward a dichotomy as you might have um, been led to believe. Agreed. Andrew, any thoughts? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with what David said. Uh, and also just on the you know, the, the idea that there are, there are many um allowed views as you say tim it's very easy to hear that sometimes and think well that sounds a bit like pluralism but it's it's not that you know we, we're like anything goes it's it's more that there's a certain amount of stuff that's left a mystery to us and yeah. in terms of what has been revealed to us yeah. there are several things that fit the picture whilst holding a high view of scripture yeah 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 i agree yeah i wouldn't want it to come across mm. as pluralism yeah. or hey you know, um, you can kind of take whatever views you want. I mm-hmm. think there's certain things that are in place, aren't yeah. they? And certain things that are set. Um, yeah, we might be digging into that a little bit as, as we go through. I think the other thing to say, Tim, just yeah. quickly by way of introduction is, and I think I made this point when um, in the session that I was leading, I'll maybe make it again when we come back in a couple of weeks, but we're not looking to influence people to a particular really conclusion. Um we're not looking to disrespect any view at all um, when we talk about different ways of reading Genesis 1, Genesis 2, and indeed other parts of the Bible. Um, we want to honour the range of views that Andrew just referred to, um, all of which can be um, held by people with a very high view of Scripture as you describe it. And we're not seeking to influence, we're simply seeking to explore and enable people to explore the topic for themselves. Yeah, yeah. No, that's true. And I think we said even on the evenings, you know, we sort of set up some boundaries around let's treat each other well in this. Yeah. It can be a contentious thing. It can be a passionate thing, can't it? People are passionate about, um, and and we should be, you know, we get passionate about um, the Bible and about science as well. Um, But we treat each other well and honour each other in that. Um, 
Yeah, okay. So hopefully that's helpful in terms of introduction. Um, but session one, um, what we did was really focused right in on Genesis 1 and 2. Um, and um, just before we, we went on to record, Andrew reminded me that you actually couldn't make session one. So yeah, yeah. this will be news to you. You it can will, learn yeah, as you go, yeah, Andrew. Um, <laughs> uh, David was there was. And, um, and it was a great, a great session. Um, and, and really interactive, I think people mm. really got into it. But what we did to begin with um, is we did a list of scriptures uh, and asked people from those scriptures to sort of, in their best way possible, to draw a picture of how the, um, those in the ancient world, um, by which we took quite a broad stroke of time, if you like, would have viewed or might have viewed the world that they live in. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'll list the scriptures. I've got them here. I won't read them all because that would take too long. But um, are you guys okay if we flick through a few? Mm, definitely. That'd be all right. So um, Genesis 1, um, 6 to 10. So this isn't strictly in Genesis now. This is going through a bit, bit bigger than the Bible. But um, Genesis 1, 6 to 10 says, And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and it separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. Okay, so this idea that there's some sort of expanse, um, which is sort of referring, you know, to the sky and that there's waters below, there's waters above, there's something there. Um, Psalm 75 verse 3 um, says this. Let me just find it. Um, when the earth totters and all its inhabitants, it is I, this is God speaking through the psalmist, it is I who keeps steady its pillars. So that was interesting. So I think people sort of read that. Out. Okay, so there's, there's some pillars going on here. What, what's going on there? Um, and then in Psalm 104, uh, it says... Um, you, you are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. So there's this idea that there was sort of some sort of tent things going on, which I guess as you look up into the sky, there is sort of this idea of the heavens, which in that sense was, was really what we would call the sky, I guess, as a tent. Um, and then Psalm 148, um, verse 4 says, praise him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. So that idea of there being some sort of water above the heavens. Uh, and I won't go there. But if you want to check others out, there's, um, there's Exodus 20, 11, Nehemiah 9, 6, Proverbs 3, 19 to 20. But the whole point of doing that exercise is what it reveals really when people draw out is that the ancient view of the world that we live in is very different mm. to what we see it as today. Mm. Um, and really, you know, you can go online and search for an ancient Israelite um, picture of the, the world. And it really has sort of um, uh, the earth, which is suspended on pillars. Um, there's Sheol, the, the, you know, the, the land, you know, place of the dead, if you like, beneath. And then um, a firmament that's sort of holding back waters in, above um, with stars that are embedded into the fixed, firmament, yeah. uh, fixed mm. in, into place. Um, and I guess the purpose of doing this, partly then you, what, what we do is then you look at um, an ancient Egyptian view of the world. And it's very similar, very different in some ways, but very similar in other ways. Um, Babylonian was kind of similar. But I guess it provokes this question. The reason I put this activity in, it provokes the question, well, did the, Bi as the Bible writers, are they wrong? They're right, you know, because we know now, and I don't think there's many Christians, I don't think many, that would doubt this, but we know for sure that the stars aren't fixed in the, the firmament, don't yeah. We? Yeah, we, yeah. we? I think we're, we're on safe ground saying that, aren't we? So the question then is, you know, is, is the ancient Israelite wrong? And therefore, well, they are. And therefore, is the Bible wrong? And is that sense then God wrong? 
And I think that was really helpful sort of doing that activity because it helped me see, okay, I need to rethink how I sometimes come to the Bible because sometimes I come to it with this sense of, you know, well, you know, I'm not reading it in its context. So I just wondered what your views were, David, you were there on that that evening and you said you hadn't done that activity no, before. No, I've not done that exercise before. A few people have that I've spoken to, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I'd, in the time that I spent looking at the subject back in 2010 and a bit since as well, um, I, I'm, I'm sort of relatively familiar with that view, although I'd not done, not done yeah. the exercise in that way. Um, the writings of John Walton, I know you've yeah. come across him, I f were a bit of a light bulb moment for me. Me too. Uh, yeah. He was able to sort of put into much better words than I could and into clearer thinking, a sort of way of looking at the text that was dawning on me as I did that study. Um, uh, were they wrong? Um, and therefore, was God wrong? That's a great, great question. Uh, one of the ways I'd answer that, I think, is to say that whenever God speaks to us, uh, he's always condescending. I don't mean condescending in the way that we think, in a, in a negative yeah, way. He's yeah. always stooping, isn't he? Yeah. Humbling himself to speak to us in ways that, that we can understand. Um, and uh, I'm, as I said, no trained scientist, but my view is that if God really told us from his absolute perspective how the world came to be, how the universe came to be, even a sophisticated 21st century Western scientist would not be able to grasp it. Yeah. And so anything that he speaks to us in scripture, but also actually in creation, in the world, is God humbling himself to condescend, to be able to um, communicate in his love to us. So um, he wasn't speaking untruth, but he was speaking in a way that resonated yeah. with them and that made sense to them. So that's Part of what I'd say, I think, in answer to your, to the little and in many ways, that you posed. it has <laughs> to be that way, doesn't it? There is, a, and even, you know, he, even there's me being arrogant. Even in our time, we don't understand the complexities of the world in the way, obviously, that God does. But even in the way that we will in a hundred years, or yeah. fifty years, or twenty years, and so even our own current understanding, although we think it's complete it's far from complete isn't it so any revelation from god um, and you, you quote john he said about john walton there which um we will put some links on to resources and things but he he uses this quote which i found really helpful he says the israelites received no revelation to update or modify their scientific and you have to say that carefully because that is um yeah we'll talk about that in a bit but um Science as we know it today isn't what was active at that point anyway. But their scientific understanding of the cosmos. Um, they did not know that stars were suns. They did not know that the earth was spherical and moving through space. They did not know that the sun was much further away than the moon or even further than the birds flying in the air. And I think that's really helpful, again, to think about God wanted to speak to his people, was you know, helping them along the scientific um, timeline, if you like, a priority exactly. for him. Why did God speak Genesis 1, Genesis 2, which we as Christians with a high view of Scripture believe? Yeah, 100%. Um, it's the work of people, of men, women, but it's also the work of God, Scripture. Yeah. That's our conviction, isn't it? Yeah. Um, why did he speak it is a really important question. Was it really important for him to communicate to them the nuts and bolts of how the world, the universe was put together, my conviction would be that that's not the principal purpose. It's not that God is not interested yeah, in how yeah. the world was put together. Yeah. I think the writers of Gen writer of Genesis was interested in how the world was put together in one sense, but it wasn't the primary purpose would be my conviction. Yeah, yeah. It was more about revelation of God, revelation of um, who his people were, the place of people in his world, all that kind of thing. But maybe I'm getting on to, no, to other that's subjects. Good. Andrew, any reflections on that? Or? Yeah, that's uh, a fair all of that, really. And um, uh, you talked about the light bulb moment for you, David, and similar for me, there's a moment when it really felt like the way that you read Genesis becomes unbound from all of, all of that kind of stuff. You know, you realise for a long time you've been maybe reading it in the wrong genre, yeah. and it suddenly 
makes sense. I can't think of an example now, but there's sometimes there's a movie you watch it and you think, what on earth was that all about? And someone else explains to you, you've watched it from the wrong perspective. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. meant to be romance and you thought it was a comedy and you go, oh, okay. <laughs> makes See, sense. Now. Yeah, and then it all kind of clicks into place, doesn't mm-hmm. it? So, so that was helpful, you know, that, um, you know, in, in a sense, we could say the Israelites were scientifically wrong about the, the way the world looks. And, you know, and in a sense, they clearly weren't because what they, you know, we believe in those scriptures, that they're timeless truths, that God does stretch out the heavens like a tent, that what he was speaking through that was less about the nuts and bolts about um, space or about um, the sky, but more about the fact that he does stretch out the heavens. <laughs> you know, his hands are all over it, aren't they? And he's holding it and he's yeah. got it in place. Same with the earth, isn't it? It's not that, you know, we've since discovered there aren't physical pillars, um, but he firmly holds the land, the, the, the earth in its place, doesn't yeah. it? That is true. Yeah. That's and a I, great image, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Um, even for us to... Even today, um, it today speaks to us, doesn't speaks it? Speaks of God's um, care and involvement in our world, and His stability and security yeah. that He brings to our world, which perhaps we don't always appreciate until our world is shaken. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so they still speak today timelessly. Those images, even though we might say, "Well, now we can see a different yeah. material view of the universe." Yeah. So I think it's helpful for you know if you you're wrestling with this topic to think about. Um, that God communicates to humans in a way that we understand. Um, so, you know, the example I gave on the night is um, when the psalmist writes, you knit me together in my mother's womb. You know, we don't discredit that because we know now more about embryology and how a baby is mm. formed. God spoke. And again, there's a timeless truth in there that the 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 aim of that scripture isn't to forward the people in their understanding of how babies are formed but to know the eternal truth uh, and and that is true in their time as it is in true in our time that god does knit us together in the womb and in the same way then we need to think about and it's not quite the same um genre shift from the psalms to genesis i don't think that's fair to say but it does make us think that we need to be thoughtful about how we read the Bible and these texts. It seems to me that, again, without any form of theological training, but it seems to me the only way to read any part of Scripture is to first ask, well, what is the meaning of the text? But what was it, secondly, I guess, what was its meaning to the original recipients, the original yeah. hearers slash readers, but probably hearers, before we then ask, or what about its meaning yeah. for us? And I think when you take that basic step, that makes the um, that makes some of the pieces that we've already been discussing fit into place. I think we've got to say how did the original Israelite hearers understand this language and this? Yeah. yeah. What did it speak to them? Definitely. So let's get into that um, because we're going to talk about exegesis. Which for some people, well, I have to it, explain that Tim. Some people is a common <laughs> word that they're used to. Others will be saying, "What is? What are they on about?" Um, and sometimes we have these posh words, don't we? In in Christendom, in Christian circles, which is fine. Um, but it's not. A, I don't think it's a hard concept to th- to think about. But um, when people talk about exegesis, I think the best way to think about that is that we read the Bible in a way where we attempt to draw out from the text what the text is saying, as opposed to um, eisegesis, which is about, you know, we sort of draw in our own. We started with our thoughts and then we're going to find them in scripture. That's a simplistic way of saying it, but that's basically what got these ideas and all this scripture fits that great. Yeah. We actually read the text and we say, okay, what is this speaking to us? And um, what the, uh, someone once called it the cardinal rule. Um, so the most important rule, if you like, of exegesis is approaching the text within its context mm. or better put, its contexts. And that could be historical, cultural, geographical, ecclesiastical, ideological or literary. Again, that can sound really big words if you're not used to that, but 
basically it's about saying, okay, what is the context of this passage? Who is it speaking to? Who is writing it? What's the intent of that writer? What, yeah. what are they trying to communicate? Understanding that and then allowing that to speak. I gave two examples on the night, one which is um, not, not a very nice one, but um, I, <laughs> I once said to um, my son, oh, yeah. um, Lucas, um, who's 11, um, you know, Jesus said, take the log out of your own eye. He then laughed and said, what do you mean poo? Because he interpreted log to mean, yeah. He's going to go thank there. you for this podcast yeah, too. in many years to come. <laughs> um, and that's a classic, it's a really silly example. It's an example of, you know, you can't just come to a, a, a passage that Jesus says and says, oh, I think that word means this, therefore mm. Jesus is saying this horrible thing. Um, another example, which is probably a better one, um, Mr. Hadley, Dave Hadley, um, talked about in Psalm 23 when it says, you lead me by still waters. And he worked for Bible Society for a while. And they talked about how in some culture, still water, it speaks of um, decay, mm. um, sickness, pollution, you know, um, or, you know it's, it's a terrible thing. And so, you, you know, you can't, for them, translating for new believers, can't just put you lead me by still waters because they would interpret that as... Um, so you can't assume then that, oh, well, Jesus leads you by toxic water. What you have to say, well, what does still waters mean? In its context. Into the context um, that it's in. Mm. And I will put in here that's important, I think, because at this point, if you struggle with the Bible, if you don't like study, if you're not um, academic, you can naturally start to, I think, write yourself out, if you're not careful, of the Bible and, and, and the, its riches. And someone gave an analogy, which I really liked, of the Bible is like a gold rush. And in a gold rush, you can walk along the surface and you can pick up bits of gold here and there. But you can also dig down really deep and get some really rich um, gold. And I think that analogy helped me because I, I, I am a believer actually that you can open the Bible and at times I've done this and I know people are, and it's just randomly pick a verse and it just speaks to you. I think that can happen. I don't think that's a good discipline way after a while, but you can. But I also think you can get deeper into it and get mm. more from it and start to reap the riches of it. Um, as you dig in. So I think that's a help. So if you are thinking, oh no, you know, I don't want to do context. I don't stick in there, pick up the gold that you're getting, but be encouraged that maybe dig a, dig a little bit more. Yeah. And also I think that's a great reminder, Tim, to me of the importance of Christian community. Yeah. Um, sharing the word in, of God, the Bible in Christian community. Um, not just this immediate community of Humblecote um, Community Church, but um, you know, it could be the community of those that have gone before us who've written yeah. stuff that we can learn from the wider Christian community across the world. So we're not just ploughing our own little furrow while we trying to understand everything on our own in our own little castle. But yeah. you know, um, well, there are the three of us here tonight. There were 40 people on the yeah, evenings yeah. that we had. So um, together we, we learn more, hopefully, and those that are perhaps feel a bit less empowered by the idea of having to approach scripture in the way that you discuss can ho hopefully benefit from being part of a yeah. Christian community that encourages that respectful approach to scripture. This is why we do this. This is why we teach on a Sunday. This is why we read books. This is why we discuss, you yeah. know, um, because we're all at different places in that journey, aren't we? And that's totally fine. Yeah. So you mentioned before about genre, Andrew. Mm -hmm. So, Really, um, so just to summarise that point, um, if we're going to read Genesis 1 and 2 well, then we must take the time to respect uh, its context, to try and understand its context. What was the author trying to communicate? What are the, the, the things? And the challenge is, of course, is the further away uh, some writing is or scripture is or any kind of writing from us, then the harder it can be, you know, to understand its context and Genesis are some of the, you know, some of the oldest, you know, some of the, the um, most distant from us, if you like. So should we get into genre? Go on then. So what context is Genesis 1 and 2 written in? Um, well, we know, as we said at the start, it's not a science 
document. And we know that because science is relatively new in the way that we understand it today. Is that fair? Do you think that's fair? Or do you think, um, do you think I'm playing with words there? Because I guess there's been technology and discovery forever. Well, you know, as long as the human race has existed, but... Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a difficult one to define. When you use the term science, we, we tend to think of it in terms of modern science, but the further you go back, the more the term science kind of blends into philosophy. Okay. So it's, you know, it's... Um, I, I do agree it's not a scientific document, definitely not in terms of modern science anyway. Um, is it philosophical? Maybe, maybe a little bit, but I think yeah. what you're getting on to is... Um, what what it actually reveals about God. Yeah. Um, I, I'll stop taking your thunder. Yeah, no, that's you, fine. So I think that is helpful, isn't it? Because when you say it's not science, what we're saying is it's, if we say, you know, we approach this as a science document, we will have a load of assumptions that we'll bring to the table and impose into the text, won't we? So 21st we'll, century Western assumptions. Yeah. Exactly, that have been part of our formation, part of our culture, part of who we are. And we'll bring all that and we'll impose it onto um, a very, very ancient text and come out with all kind of things. And so you kind of have to let go of that. You can't fully shed it, can you? It's in there, you know, our culture's in there, but not approach it as a, a, a science. I think the, I'd want to say that, it, yeah, yeah, that, there is, that it is scientific. Okay, that, go. Um, and Andrew would probably know a bit more about this than me, but I, I think that it is scientific in the sense that it's ancient near Eastern science yeah um i would worry about us saying that the bible doesn't speak to the scientific endeavor at all i think it does but always in its context yeah so it doesn't speak to directly to 21st century western scientific endeavor but i think it speaks to science yeah yeah, yeah. um the scientific experts people like john lennox for example the great oxford mathematician he would argue that science is only possible from a christian that's quite a a mm. uh, brave thing, a bold yeah. thing to say, but he argues very convincingly that actually science is only possible with a Christian worldview. Um, but I think that um, I would want to say sci uh, the Bible does speak to science, but it's ancient Near yeah. Eastern science. And that's helpful link into the other thing that sometimes people... So we're saying it's not a 21st century scientific text. We agreed on that. Yeah. The other thing sometimes I've heard thrown about, oh, it's poetry, it's just poetry. And I haven't found that particularly helpful when I've been reading because I think that pushes it probably into a diff another genre that can be unhelpful where I find that actually means you can kind of interpret it how you want and it doesn't really matter. I don't get that sense when I read Genesis 1 and 2 that that's what the author's doing, you know, sort of you know, going through wild imaginations and this kind of thing, that doesn't seem to be what, what he's doing either, is it? Would you agree? Yeah, I think um, with poetry, like a poem has meaning. It's trying to say something, yeah. um, but, but often the, the specifics of the words that are chosen aren't meant to be taken so literally, yeah. but it's trying to convey the right. Okay, so let's so throw out 21st century scientific and poetry and um let's talk about what i found really helpful in this which um was a, a genre called ancient cosmology i found that helpful me too um i think that came mainly through a reading with john walton but it might have i don't know where it originated um but what it means um because you might think well, ancient cosmology what, what what we're on about i think what that means is that it belongs to a way of writing where a certain kind of group and culture in a certain point in time were trying to get to grips with speaking about how the cosmos, you know, the world, the, the universe, if you like, the creation, how it came into being. And they're trying to get to grips with that. Um, and try, as you say, I don't think it's a case of they don't care. I think they're very intentionally trying to get to grips with it. And you can kind of... Um, uh, on the evening, we, we had a little bit of a chat about who wrote Genesis 1 and 2. Um, but really, you, you know, if you take the genre of ancient Near Eastern cosmology, that kind of covers from, which is a big time, but 3000 BC 
to 323 BC. It's a huge amount of time, but it's a load of civilizations and people groups in, a, in a, um, the ancient Near East that were writing to try and understand this, uh, the way the world came about, really. Mm. Yeah? So I'd like to place it there. And what I'd like to do is give some examples. Is that okay? Of why I think it's helpful there. And that's because what happened is for many, many, many years, it was kind of considered that Genesis 1 and 2 were totally unique. It was like, you know, that's, that's all there is, there always. And then um, there were some discoveries, as there often is, and they discovered a load of other texts, um, which were, you know, on, um, on uh, inscriptions and things like that which suddenly threw the sort of scholarly world into chaos around this. And everyone started to think, oh, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's not original. It's not a kind of unique text. And um, that led to some beliefs that, you know, Genesis 1 and 2 were copied or based on or basically the same as other ancient Near Eastern cosmologies. And I think it's worth saying that because if you do a sort of Google search, you'll probably find a load of stuff around that, you know, that actually it's not, not unique. So I thought I'd read some. It's always good to read some ancient cosmology. And we did this on the night. One of the helpful things about this is if you struggle with the Bible, you'll realise that it's a lot kinder a document <laughs> than some of these documents. So um, the first one I'm going to read, uh, where is it? I've got it on this one, is... Um, Enuma Eilish, which is a Babylonian text, which comes from around the 11th century. Um, oh, it's not in that one. Okay, I'll read it out of this one. Um, and it says, it says lots of things. It goes on and on and on and on and on forever. And apparently, I didn't realise, but there's still a load of Babylonian um, pillars that they've dug up with inscriptions on that are still not translated. Oh, really? Wow. And thousands of them, apparently, that people mm. are working through. So we've got, still got things we're going to learn and things we're going to find mm. out in the years to come, which is really exciting. But they found this. It says, um, When in the height heaven was not named, and the earth beneath did not yet bear a name, and the primeval Apsu, who begat them, and Chaos Tiamut, the mother of them both, their waters were mingled together, and no field was formed, no marsh was to be seen, when the gods none had been called into being. There's a little sec section of it. And uh, I imagine, as on the night when you say this, a lot of people say that sounds nothing like, <laughs> that's nothing like Genesis 1 or 2. Um, but I think it is helpful to, here's a list that I found um, online that gives some of the, the similarities. So in both, um, obviously I haven't been have time to get through it all, but in both stories, matter exists when creation begins. Um, similar to Enuma Eilish, Genesis 1 describes God ordering chaos, not creating something out mm. of nothing. Mm. So similarities there. Um, the darkness precedes the creative acts. And then this is the one that you might have come across or some might have heard. In Enuma Eilish, the symbol of chaos is the goddess Tiamat, who personifies the sea. Genesis refers to the deep, and the Hebrew word is to home, which is linguistically related to Tiamat. So again, when that kind of came out, a load of scholars went, oh, you know, there's chaos here, there's chaos here, similar word. Uh, in both stories, light exists before the creation of the sun, moon and stars. In both stories, there's division of water and earth. They go on. And let me read another one, um, which I really... Um, found interest in the Memphite theology. This was Egyptian, 15th to the 11th century BC. And you might recognise some more similarities in this one, I think. Again, a tiny section. Uh, but there came into being, this is the, the Memphite theology, there came into being from the heart and there came into being from the tongue, in, uh, something in the form of atom. Indeed, all the divine order really came into being through what the heart thought and the tongue commanded mm. and God said mm. very very similar there and um, what happened really is sort of these texts were found and people started sort of saying well that's it we've, we've sort of cracked Genesis 
we found out it's nothing any different from any other um, document. But then it began to change and people began to realise that actually, yes, there were similarities, but there were also huge differences. Do you want to comment on any of that before I carry on and talk about similarities no. and differences? Or You go, go for it, yeah. carry on, Tim. So um, similarities, there are similarities, no doubt. Uh, Genesis 1 and 2, um, it says the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Um, so there's pre-cosmic waters. It's a very s common theme in that um, region at that time. Most have some sort of reference to life beginning in the waters. It's a really common thing. Um, another one has a pre-existent primeval ocean. Um, so uh, one writer says the... The idea of life originating in the primeval sea is so f widely found in Near Eastern traditions that a single point of origin may never be determined. And then other similarities, creation is often about naming and, you know, the gods name things. That mm. was a very important thing in this genre. And obviously God in Genesis um, names, you know, he names, gives names to the creation. Um, there's separating that was a common act of creation. So um, in, in this one, um, they, you know, they split Tiamat down and, and then use part of her for the land and part of her for the sky, isn't it, or some other part. Uh, in another one, they get a copper tool and they split something. I can't remember quite what they split. Um, so there's this idea of separating things, and that's reflected definitely in Genesis um, as well as God separates the heavens and the earth, he separates um, the waters from the waters, etc. Uh, and then also um, there is this idea of temple building as well, that um, a lot of it is linked to temple building. Mm. So I guess what we're saying for the, the listener is when you look at Genesis 1 and 2 and you look at ancient Near Eastern cosmologies of other religions and people groups, there are lots of similarities in words that are used and things that are said. And I think that ultimately what that says, although it was used to say at some point, well, that shows there's nothing special about Genesis. We'll come to differences in a bit. Actually, what it says to me is this was a people group that lived in a certain time and place. Mm. So if we talked about the world today as Christians, we'd probably use similar terms to other people groups and religions in our time, wouldn't we? Yeah. Do you think? Yeah, I think it's um, interesting to think about. One of the questions that was, or one of the comments that was made to me in the group that I was sitting in on the night, I think it's a, it's a really, it's a comment really worth thinking about. Someone said, um, just assume for the sake of argument that the author of Genesis 1 and 2 was Moses. I mean, there's certainly a, you know, yeah. that's been the traditional view and I'm comfortable with that. Um, someone said, Moses, and you can see this through the first five books of the Bible very clearly, was very um, careful not to uh, not to um, identify God with any other gods, but yeah. the God of the Israelites. Very, and we'll come to differences. I know we're coming to differences. So it was very much the purity of the Israelite religion was important, separating it from the, you might say, pagan gods yeah. and pagan religions around them. So the question was, and I think it's a very fair question, why would Mo surely Moses, as the author of this text, leading that people with that approach to the world around him, surely he wouldn't borrow from pagan ideas? But I wonder if, I think perhaps the way you said it at the end, Tim, is perhaps... Um, a better way of looking at it, I wonder. I wonder if it's actually the other way around, where it would be, maybe the question is, how likely would it be that Moses, who was living in that world, would come up with something that was so radically different yeah. and bore no relation to the world in which he grew up and the world in which he dwelt? Um, and if we believe that anything that is true ultimately comes from God, even though it might get corrupted yeah, yeah. in various forms, we would say as Christians, wouldn't we? Um, then it is quite possible that 
growing up in that environment and God in his goodness and kindness um, reveals himself in part, doesn't he? The Bible itself says this, through his creation. Yeah. Some people in the ancient world grasped it in that way. Moses grasped it in that way, but they were still grasping it with a common understanding of that world and sharing, of course, a common mm. environment, a common, not only a common intellectual environment, but a common literal environment. Does that, does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what I, think the, I think the point and the question is very good, but I wonder if you approach it from, the, from that slightly different perspective, whether that helps to ease that concern. Mm. Do you see what, I yeah. don't know if I've explained that yeah, clearly. Mm-hmm. Any thoughts, Andrew? Yeah, I, I just love the fact that through all these many, many years, all of that has been preserved in the text and the, 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 we can yeah. see those similarities today and they're that really they're there point. as clues as to which genre to read it in. Yeah, uh, yeah. And even uh, God's providence in, as you said, um, we're discovering new things all the time and, and the way that that filters into our understanding of the text, it's 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 a... A great example just of seeing God's providence and his preservation of his word, really. And we shouldn't be afraid, should we, these discoveries, you know, yeah, if God is true, which we believe he is, and he speaks truth, then actually these things, hopefully, when we wrestle with them and through the Holy Spirit and through working it through, actually it can bring light to truth and what God yeah. is saying. So let's look at the difference. So those are the similarities. So I guess what that says to me is this, um, Really, that there was a, an understanding, a way of seeing the world. We can call it a cognitive environment. That's kind of a technical term, if you like. But a way of viewing the world that the people who wrote the Bible shared in that. And again, it's not one way because the Bible was written at different times by different people. But there was a shared kind of understanding of how the world was, what it was like, what it looked like. And the people that God chose to spoke, speak to and through, shared in that. And God was kind of, he was fine with that. He, he didn't think it needed updating. He didn't think that those particular things needed erasing. What he wanted to do is speak some truth into, into that environment. That environment yeah, yeah. And then allow the scientific discovery to kind of, which I'm sure he's a big part of, reveal itself through time but what was the truth that he spoke mm. into those times? And that's the differences, really. And these are some of the differences. There are others. Um, there's no polytheism, which basically means there's no multiple gods in most, if, well, in all of the other ones, there are multiple gods. Um, and the, the gods have interactions and all of that, whereas there is very clearly one God uh, in the, the Genesis account. Um, there's no what's called theogony, which basically means the creation of the gods. Um, you know, God is not created, which um, the other gods come into existence. They of, often have genealogies that go back, you know, loads and loads of different gods that have different gods and begat gods. And there's none of that. There's no hint of um, deifying the created elements. So many of the other cosmologies, um, the elements, you know, the sun, the moon, their worship, they kind of mm. got a sense. And, Actually, most of the gods functioned with the, the created elements and were a big part of that. There's none of that. God is separate to them, distinct from them, clearly in, in control. Um, we've thrown out some big words. There's no <laughs> theomachy, which is fighting gods. There's no yeah. gods at war, which, you know, if you look at some of the ways that humans came about, for example, through the, the fighting of the gods, there's none of that in Genesis. Um, the way that humans are created is carefully, thoughtfully, lovingly, and with intentionality. That's different. And then a real big one is the image of God, um, which really stands out, I think, in terms of when you look at the other, the, the, the way that humans are seen as the image of God mm. on earth uh, is very, very unique mm. um, to, to these cosmologies, really. Yeah, that's so beautiful, isn't it? And maybe again is an, is another comment that could be made on uh, that question about would the writer of Genesis really have borrowed from that shared mm. cognitive environment? I think of the role of um, the people of God, people of Israel, through their history was to 
bear witness to the rest of the world, wasn't it? Right mm-hmm. from the beginning, that was it wasn't to be its own little enclosed people. We know that that's over time in many ways how it became, but its whole reason to be was to bless the whole world. And so I think it's a beautiful thing that they could say, we share your understanding of how the world is and was, but actually see our God, how much he cares, how great he is, how there is no challenger to his sovereignty. Um, Come and share in that life with us. We know that Israel messed it up like we all do, (laughs) not pointing the finger at them. But I think that's a beautiful thing that the shared... Um, cognitive environment and these amazing differences. I think it enables them and empowers them to bear witness to the world around them. Yeah, 100%. Okay, I'm looking at time and thinking we need to finish. <laughs> so, Probably the listeners are as well. Yeah, so um, <laughs> I suppose my hope is really that by doing this, it kind of maybe gives a little bit of a light bulb moment to some listening that you think, oh, okay. So this is a specific text written in a time and a place that has a context that needs to be read in a certain way. And we haven't gone into the depths of what that means, but hopefully just understanding that genre can, can hopefully begin to open up possibilities for people of what then God may be saying through it. And I would just put that for for you. You know, we use the term ancient cosmology. You don't have to use that term. Mm. Some people wouldn't, some, you know, believers wouldn't use that term. That's fine. It's been helpful for me to place it in its time and its place and say, okay, this is what Moses or whoever wrote it was communicating to this people. This was his environment. But what was he saying? And therefore, really, what is God saying through him to those people first and foremost and then through them to us today as 21st century believers so i hope that's helpful do join us for podcast number two and number three uh, when we're going to look together at what the theory of the, the big bang theory and the theory of evolution how that impacts that reading and uh, how we can continue to Uh, hear the Bible faithfully, read the Bible faithfully um, as we consider those topics. Thank you for listening to this podcast from Amblecote Community Church. For more information about who we are, what we believe and how you can get involved, check out our website, amblecotecc.org.uk.